Hey, welcome back Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy, and this is all of the Easter eggs, references, and little things you might have missed in The Bad Batch, episode 13, Into the Breach. So, that title might sound familiar because it's from Act 3, Scene 1 of Shakespeare's Henry V. When the king is leading his troops against the French port of Harfleur, they're beaten back. But then he rallies the troops and proclaims, Once more into the breach, dear friend! Okay, sir, what's a breach? Well, a breach is like a gap in the wall. Into the breach has also become an idiom for whenever somebody steps in to solve a problem. Oh, like the work toilet is clogged, and once more into the breach, person goes. Exactly. And in this episode, I think the title means a couple of things. One, Omega is literally entering a gap in the wall in her room. But also, both she and the rest of the Bad Batch are once again repeating story beats from earlier in the season, trying to escape Mount Tantus and trying to find Mount Tantus. Hence, once more into the breach. As soon as we see Mount Tantus, the Kiner's machine score hits us right away. Now, we've pointed out how this mechanical theme goes all the way back to the first episode when the control chips made the clones execute Order 66. Shout out to this excellent video on Hobrick's YouTube channel for that observation. But that theme keeps being repeated whenever we go to Mount Tantus because Tantus is actually the end result of what Order 66 began. Order 66 stripped away the clones' freedom and reduced their entire existence to one phrase. Good soldiers pull up orders. This showed how the Emperor, and by extension the Empire, did not see them as people. The Empire sees clones as products. At Tantus, the Empire is trying to replicate life so they can use it as an industrialized product. It's why everything on Tantus is always uniform, it's in boxes, and why the theme here is so mechanical. We begin at the base of the mountain, and you know what? I never noticed that there's actually at least two of these mountains. Also, the rings carved into the mountain faces resemble the trenches and the Death Star. Now, an interesting story here. The Death Star trench was actually a mistake. The bottle split in the center and gave us one of the all-time greatest action climaxes in cinema. But the Death Star's ring also marked it as something unnatural. It was the Empire's attempt to take something natural, a celestial body, and replicate it as a machine designed for war. That's no moon. And that's also what Mount Tantus is, a natural earthwork that houses an unnatural practice, creating Force-sensitive clones. And the episode even shows us this idea visually later in the episode. We see Mount Tantus' rings from above, showing us a circle within a circle. And then we cut to within those rings at the child prison, where the tables also create circles within circles. It's subtly showing us the many layers of security that Omega will have to escape through to be free. Oh, I see. That reminds me of something my mother said when I was just a pup. She would say, Namaste, dog. Oh my god, guys, these kids are bleeding me dry. Why are you wearing a trash bag today? Uh, the kids started school. They need clothes, new shoes, tooth fairy dues. I'm broke, man. Hey, are you guys hiring? Ooh. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, you know. We kind of already just have me and Doug. We like the dynamic a lot. I mean, like, if you need money, then you should start, like, a real career, like being a back-end web developer. Well, I don't know anything about computers, except how to play RPGs. Complete quests, get XP, level up, you know. Well, hold on. That's the beauty of it, because you can get into back-end web development with Boot.dev. They're the sponsor of this video. Boot.dev is built like a captivating RPG game, but to win, you have to learn code. You learn back-end web development from start to finish in the Python and Go programming languages. You see, the trick to learning is to make sure that you are never bored, which is why Boot.dev's RPG platform is perfect. You level up, gain XP, all while writing a ton of code. Because getting your hands on the keyboard and shipping projects is the only way to really learn. I mean, dude, look, according to Stack Overflow, the median salary for back-end web developers in the United States in 2023 was over $100,000. Over $100,000? That buys a lot of tiny puppet shoes. And if you ever get stuck, it's okay. There is a bear wizard named Boots that helps you with your lessons instead of just giving you the answers. Plus, the Boot.dev Discord community is very active. And I know you're going to love this. They know that not everyone can necessarily afford a membership. So you can read and watch the lessons in guest mode, but a paid membership unlocks the game and the interactivity. Plus, they offer a 30-day money-back guarantee. So click the link in the description box and use my code to get 25% off your first payment for Boot.dev. That's 25% off your first month or your first year depending on the subscription that you choose. Now back to what I was saying. Inside the mountain we see the classic Imperial mouse droid and my favorite gag in the episode was when one of these guys was sucked up through the ship's vacuum lift. <laughs> and of course we first saw one of those used to capture R2-D2 way back in A New Hope. <laughs> 
Johnny says vacuum. This scientist is accompanied by an Imperial nanny droid. Now, we saw these guys all through the Clone Wars, but also in the Bad Batch going all the way back to Episode 1, Aftermath. And you know, I actually went back through the seasons of the Bad Batch recently, like, you know, to cover the show, and then I got curious about the Clone Commandos. Now, the Commandos appeared briefly in the Clone Wars, and they were the focus of the Republic Commando first-person shooter. So, in that game, we see how elite and highly trained these soldiers are. But I noticed that you rarely see these guys in the Clone Wars, and you also rarely see them at the start of the Bad Batch. But then, Scorch becomes kind of a heavy antagonist throughout the series, and the Commandos become more and more common. And now, suddenly, we see the Commandos in any scene that deals with high security. I think that after Senator Chuchi unveiled her clone retirement package in Season 2, many clones took the option to retire. But the ones that stayed were given additional training and became clone Commandos. We see them all throughout this episode, and they're always leading the conscripted TK Troopers. It's almost like they're the veterans that are sticking around long enough to train the new recruits. What did you forget? Walk them through the... Uh, what? The metal detector. That's okay. Try again. Earlier I mentioned how the Empire always infiltrates the natural world and then remakes it into something standardized and industrial. In Andor, we saw them starting to do this on Aldani, gradually erasing local customs to make way for their own military bases. But even in that show, the Imperials had to sit in quiet awe of natural events like the Eye. In keeping with this theme of usurping nature to create order, the Empire has carved their base out of a mountain, and notice how everything is always square. Omega Cell, made up of squares, her pillow is a square, and even Dr. Carr sees the world through these grid-like square glasses. One thing I liked about this episode was seeing Omega's full character arc. When we first meet her on Kamino, she's kind of an annoying kid who's bright, but like has no skills. So when we first meet her, Omega's essentially a prisoner, but she doesn't seem to mind. Hello. But now she's been trained. She knows tech manuals, and she is a fire. So all through this episode, we can see her slowly, quietly piecing together all these pieces that she needs to break herself out. Omega has become a soldier. And that reminds me, I want to quickly remind you about this Good Soldiers Follow Order shirt that we designed for our merch store. It is inspired by the ending of the Clone Wars when Ahsoka was standing over the graves of the 332nd with text that reminds us of how futile their deaths were. Good Soldiers Follow Orders. We love designing these shirts for you guys, and it's a big thrill when we see them out in the wild when we do things like live events. Shopping our merch store is a great way to support our channel, and you can find a link for all of our original human-made merchandise below. So, Omega is locked up with the four sensitive Cortexafan kids. We're reminded of who everyone is. Eva is the Iktachi girl, and she has the Tuka doll that Omega made. Tukas are like the Tuka cats that we saw in Rebels and in The Mandalorian. Remember, Wrecker gave Omega his Tuka doll Lula when she came on board with the squad. Thank heavens, the doll survived the Marauder's explosion and is safe on Pabu. The Miri Aelin kid is Jax. You remember, he tried to escape a few episodes ago. Afterwards, he was placed in isolation, and in this episode, Episode, we can see just how broken he is. There's no way out of here. We're never going home. We also learn that the Pantoran is named Sammy, and the cat baby from two episodes ago is named Baron. And in the balcony, we can see the episode's first glimpse of an RA-7 droid, like we first saw in the Sandcrawler in A New Hope. And you know, I was thinking about the Empire kidnapping all these Force-sensitive kids, and about how not too long before this, parents all over the galaxy were offering up their toddlers to the Jedi Order. So like, if the Empire just wanted Force-sensitive kids, all they had to do was tell parents they were, you know, like restarting the Jedi Order. But of course, Palpatine's pride and ego would never allow him to let people think the Jedi were anything but scum. Jedi scum. And then we go to Hunter and Rampart on Bora Vo, the former home of the Kamino cloning facility that we saw back in Season 1, Episode 9. So this place is one of the few abandoned safe houses that they have left. Then Echo shows up, finally, finally Echo, you're finally like helping these guys out, with a stolen shuttle. Now, this shuttle looks like a combination between an Imperial New Class shuttle and the Bad Batch's Omicron Class attack shuttle, R.I.P. the Marauder. We're not Actually, the big belly on this thing looks a lot like a Sentinel-class troop transport. And we do see these trooper jump seats, the same seating you'll see in airplanes that bring paratroopers into battle. Rampart reveals that all the Navigation 2 Tantus is done through Imperial Station 003, the massive space station orbiting Coruscant that we've seen throughout this season, like when Cad Bane dropped off the wee baby Ba Ren. Now, I'm glad to finally have a name to put to it, because mentally I was always thinking, oh yeah, it's the station that looks like Regular 1 from Wrath of Khan. Rampart is forced to don a captain's uniform, like the one we first saw Captain Piet wearing in Empire strikes back. But Rampart is careful to remind us. I didn't just make it to Vice Admiral on looks alone. 
Now, I love this detail because like throughout Rebels and the novels and the comics, we always see Imperial officers were really only ever interested in forwarding their own careers. So Rampart being forced to take a lower rank would really rankle him. Back on Tantus, Omega is making plans. When she sees that Dr. Carr gave Eva her Tuka doll instead of throwing it away, she knows that Emery is sympathetic to these children. And she starts to barely pry open that emotional door like she's gonna pry open the tiles from her wall. Where did they come from? I don't know, but they are well looked after here. I'd like to believe you. She observes everything around her that is a tool, every toy she might use, and evaluates the people trapped with her. I love how this story has evolved from her being annoying kid sidekick to, you know, badass warrior poet. Ahsoka Tano had a similar arc in the Clone Wars. She started off as a pretty annoying tween who was there to keep the kids happy. You're stuck with me, Sky Guy. But after a few years of being a child soldier, she ends her puberty by bringing down Darth Maul. I'm going to die! You don't know what you're doing! <laughs> Back on the shuttle, the Bad Batch strip down their armor to make it look standard issue, which doesn't work at all. Yeah, you know, why not just steal some armor? There was a bunch of armor on Barton 4. Yeah, well, maybe they stole that armor, but it was on the Marauder. We're not a Rampart says, You're the ones that are going to stand out like overheated Gamorreans. Now, Gamorreans, of course, are the pig people who guarded Jabba's palace and Return of the Jedi, and as we saw in the Book of Boba Fett, they can throw down. <laughs> Rampart makes a good point, though. I would not want to be sitting in the middle airplane seat between two sweaty pig people. Pigs don't sweat. Is that true? Yeah, I don't know. So when they arrive at the station, Rampart is able to hustle them inside by name-dropping Governor Tarkin. If you have an issue with that, Lieutenant, then contact Governor Tarkin. Who we saw a hollow of a couple episodes ago. Now at this point, he is still a governor, and a few years away from being the Grand Moff that we met in A New Hope, who had the power to order around Darth Vader. Vader, release him. As you wish. So this moment when Rampart invokes a superior is something we see a lot of in Star Wars. Colonel Pettigrew will be making those decisions. The Emperor ruled the galaxy through fear, and that trickled down to all of his subordinates. He remade the galaxy into his image, the image of a Sith. So everyone is always looking out for themselves, and everybody is afraid of getting in trouble with the bosses. I mentioned earlier how we always see clone commandos in high security areas, and they're always leading the conscripted TK troopers. Now you can always spot a Gen 1 Stormtrooper armor because the helmets look like they were fitted as a separate piece from the mask, more like Darth Vader's mask and helmet. But aesthetically, this is all creating a visual difference between the Empire and the Bad Batch. When the Empire first started, the Batch were like slightly different from the other Imperial clone troopers. They looked different, their armor was a different color, but at least they sounded the same. But now the only clone troopers have these glowing visors, making them appear machine-like, and they're leading troops that never served in the war. This reads ship inventory, and then this scrolling text reads R R U A H U R X E R M N, and then like the rest of it's gibberish, which come on animators, I'm right here. Give me something to do. Make the memorial wall in season two actually mean something, you know? Is this all you can conjure, Saruman? And by the way, it does also just say logistics at the bottom here. This reads Science Vessel, and this reads Station. Presumably the full title is 003 Station, the name of the station, and the top reads Location Stats. We also see this idea reflected by the new Imperial Load Lifter droids. These are bipedal like humans or protocol droids, but their cycloptic faces give them a more inhuman appearance. Also, when the series began, the Empire mostly operated out of facilities that were part of the Republic, and they still had Clone Wars architecture, but Station 003 was built after the Empire was formed, and man can you tell. Its design and architecture are all very original trilogy. The hangar bay looks just like the Death Stars, with the walls and floor made from this onyx reflective metal, and in the hallway we spot an Imperial pilot wearing the breathing mask with tubes running out from it. Eventually, these will be altered to make their armor completely black. Now, maybe this is because during the Clone Wars, the armor was white. So, you know, if they had to abandon ship, you could still pick them up in space. But Imperial TIE Fighters had no shields, so they didn't really didn't care if these guys lived or died. So if one of them ejected, they didn't mind if they couldn't find them in the blackness of space. And here we also see an Imperial gunner, like the guys in the Death Star who pulled the trigger on Alderaan. You know, they were actually designed to- Designed to look like they're wearing executioner hoods. Yeah, how did you know that? Because you said that last week. But yeah, well, I don't know if everybody watching was watching last week. If you were, sorry, I repeat a few Easter eggs now and then. There's always somebody new watching. So they hustle their way into a data room that looks exactly like the security station in the original Death Star. The scenes even play out the same way with the same story beat. They enter with the ruse. An officer gets suspicious. And then they start blasting. The difference is the Bad Batch mostly use the stun setting now. Now, we only saw the stun setting used once in the original trilogy when the stormtroopers want to capture Leia alive. Everyone else, even the heroes, is always 
straight up murdering each other. But in this show, the Bad Batch started off with lasers, but now they're always being gentle with people. Now, I think in a meta way, this is an interesting transition. One thing that sets Star Wars apart from Star Trek, at least in the early days, is that Star Trek had the stun setting. It established that Starfleet was not warriors or colonizers, they were explorers. Whereas Star Wars was, you know, pew pew pew, laser laser. But now, Star Wars heroes are also taking pains to not kill. I think this is because shows like The Clone Wars and The Bad Batch have really made us think about the experience of the soldiers. In the original films, stormtroopers were these inhuman guys with scary faces. But in The Clone Wars, we get to know the clone troopers. And in this show, we see that stormtroopers are just ordinary guys who were drafted into service. Or, you know, they just don't want to show too much murder on a kid's show. Yeah, they were not worried about that PG stuff when I was a kid. So, while all that's going on, Wrecker is just chilling on his phone. What's he watching there? We find out that they can't steal the Tantus coordinates from the computer, but there is a ship leaving for Tantus. So then the Bad Batch work out this scheme where Echo is going to sneak on board to disable the ship's hull sensors. Then the Batch's shuttle can dock and hitch a ride to Tantus. Why don't they just use a tracker? Yes, that's a good point. Last episode, Crosshair tried to put a tracker on Clone X's ship, similar to the one the Imperials put on the Millennium Falcon in A New Hope. You're sure the homing beacon is secure aboard their ship? But in this episode, they specifically say that the science vessel's sensors would detect them. So I'm guessing that their hull sensors would have detected a tracker as well. The real question is, can they last this whole trip to Tantus without the Empire just turning those hull sensors back on? Back on Tantus, we see Omega's escape plan taking shape. Now, I've been talking for a while about how the Tantus prison seems to be taking a lot of inspiration from Andor. The prisoners with jobs wear monochromatic jumpsuits. They're on a low platform while the jailers observe them from high above, and they work at isolated tables on the floor all day. And now, Omega using a tool to open the wall is similar to Cassie and using a tool to pry open the pipe in the head. And then back on the station, we see that the ship going to Tantus is an Imperial research vessel, like the one we first saw in the episode Metamorphosis. The loading dock is filled with TK troopers, astromechs, loading droids, and the aforementioned mouse droid that gets pulled up into the vacuum like a penny into a hoover. The Arabesh here reads alert, and here it reads shield status. So I thought the ticking clock in this last sequence was paced very well. I loved how Hunter had to put his trust in Echo and just sort of go with his feelings, you know, almost his version of trusting in the Force. And I also love these 80s style computer graphics. You know, everything in the Republic era was so sophisticated and elegant and technologically advanced. Even the computer displays, you know, were hologram. But in the Empire, everything is stripped down and more rudimentary. Now, this was obviously because of the technological limitations of the 1970s and 80s when they made the original trilogy. But I love how they're implementing this in universe. In the Empire, you don't need design frills. You don't need to pay extra for holographic displays. Everything is stripped down to its basic parts because all of the real funding is going to big projects like Stardust or Necromancer on Mount Tantus. And one of my favorite parts of the Bad Batch is getting to see this transition between the two trilogies happen very slowly. Like when you sit down and watch the entire saga, it's going to make it not feel so abrupt. Well guys, there's two more episodes left of this show. How do you think it's going to end? Let me know down in the comments or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe, smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.